Crispin Miller compares President Bush's leadership to that of ruthless dictators in his new book, Cruel and Unusual, Bush Cheney's New World Order. This talk from Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C. is an hour, 15 minutes. Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome, everybody, uh, to Politics and Prose tonight. My name is Virginia Harabin. I'm the floor manager here at Politics and Prose, and we're here to have a discussion with Mark Crispin Miller about his new book, Cruel and Unusual, Bush Cheney's New World Order. Uh, we've had some discussion this week in the store with our customers, um, some of whom have been asking, what's up with all the anti-Bush books <laughs> on the wall? And I've had to try to explain that um, this is a really unpopular administration, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's provoked a lot of, uh, a lot of commentary. Uh, Mark Crispin Miller wrote the excellent Bush dix dyslexicon several years ago um, at a time when Bush's mangled English was largely regarded by his admirers as folksy and endearing or else by others simply as evidence of W's bovine ineptitude. It was the good stuff for anthologies of funny presidential bloopers. Mark Crispin Miller was able to discern pattern and method in Bush's muddle. And now with cruel and unusual, he examines the damage wrought by an ascendant right wing, aided by an uncritical and subservient press. This book provokes outrage about what's happening to the Constitution, the melting wall between church and state, and the lack of opposition on the part of the press. He's, Mark Crispin Miller is still listening very carefully to the utterances of George Bush. And he rightly wants to explore what it means when Bush says, for example, regarding the invasion of Iraq, international law was standing in the way of the right thing to do. <laughs> that's not funny. That's worth thinking about. Um, this is a really important and insightful book, and we're so glad to welcome Mark Crispin Miller. Thank you, and thanks for that introduction. That was, that was terrific. You really read it. Uh, it is striking how many anti-Bush books are out there, but it shouldn't come as any surprise. I mean, if the press, so-called, were doing its job, there wouldn't be a need for all these books. You, yeah. But you, you, can't, you can't destroy energy. It has to go somewhere. So it's, it's a lot of it's been fed through the publishing companies, and it's also uh, expressed copiously in cinema. There's all kinds of movies coming out, which is great. You know, it's, it's, it's very encouraging. Um, we need encouragement. Uh, now, I, ha I can't pretend to have read uh, a fraction of all these books. Uh, I, it seems that every day new ones appear. I've read a number of them, and every one I've read is, has been excellent. I mean, I've learned a lot from, from all of them. Uh, but I have to say, and th I say this not out of immodesty, but as a kind of foreshadowing for, for dramatic effect, I don't think any of the books that I've read thus far get to the heart of the matter. Not even that one. <laughs> we're, we're up against, he held up a copy of Fortunate Son, the, you know, controversial biography. We're up against something uh, the likes of which we've never seen in our country's history. Something that we've never seen within the confines of our mainstream political traditions. I uh, wanted to write a book that would lay this out, that would make this as clear as possible because the press w has never made it clear and probably would never make it clear. There's something going on here that's not easily explained in the usual left liberal terms. It's all about oil. It's all about corporate power. It's all about money. It's all about the ruling class. Now, they, sure, these things are all at work, obviously. But uh, there's something else 
going on here. There's something else that, that can't be captured so rationally. And it's something that makes the current crisis acute. There's two, two questions I'm addressing in this book. I'm also doing a show off Broadway, by the way. <coughs> if, if, if he gets back in, don't blame me, all right? It's called uh, pa Patriot Act. We did it uh, for a month in the summer. We're going to do it each night of the convention. And then once, once a week uh, until the election, I if any. <laughs> and if, if there's a protracted crisis like last time, we'll, we'll perform it throughout the crisis, okay, till, till we vanish. Uh, um, to the New York Theater Workshop. And, and the, sh the show and the book both entertain these two questions. Uh, what exactly do they want? I mean, what are they after? That's one question. And the other is, wh what, what do they know? I mean, what's in their minds? What is it that they know? Now, I'm going to take you through the book very quickly. Uh, and I hope to uh, sort of illustrate the way I, I, I reply to these questions just by telling you what's in the book. Cruel and Unusual begins with an, with an uh, evocation of uh, Thomas Jefferson, who, who is the hero of the book. He appears throughout the book. Uh, specifically, I start out by qu quoting his exquisite first inaugural address where he basically provides us with a, a very moving catalog of all those things that make this country great. Uh, I don't have to tell you what they are, but it's, it's uh, you know, worth recalling that this country was based on notions of freedom of thought, freedom of speech, majority rule, habeas corpus, all this stuff that I think uh, whose stuff whose, whose vast importance, I think, tends to become invisible to us over time, especially given the way we're taught American history in schools. I mean, I, speaking for myself, it was so boring I could barely keep my eyes open. And indeed, it wasn't until this crisis started that I, I, I returned to the subject, you know, to look for some kind of, some kind of sucker, you know. Um, well, my point in the first chapter is that on every single, every single ideal invoked by Jefferson in that, in that inaugural address has been violated completely by this administration. In other words, the divergence between Bush, Cheney, and Jefferson is, is, is enormous. Now, I'm not just talking about in intelligence and literary skill. I mean, of course, it's unfair to compare Jefferson with any modern president. You know, because let's face it, this is the age of lead, you know. Um, but, I, you know, it's, it's not a case of being fair or unfair. You know, I find that Bush supporters are extremely defensive of Bush as a person, uh, as if they want to protect him from criticism, from Bush bashing. Who cares, you know? This is not about a guy and whether he's likable or not. This is about the state of our republic and really the future of democracy. So I think it's, it's extremely important that we take note of the fact that Bush and Cheney are, are the anti-Jefferson. The chapter takes us through the various ways in which they have trashed his and his colleagues' ideals. Uh, the overall point is that we, we, we kind of lost touch with the vision of the Constitution. Some of us know little bits of it. Some of us have a kind of pedantic acquaintance with it. But we, we've sort of forgotten how important it is and what it is. I, I guess you could say that it's been, it's been hijacked and tarred as liberal. So, you know, nobody really wants to talk about it because an entirely different an opposite set of values has come to replace the ones that animate that document. Well. My view is that the prime culprit here is not the, the political actors themselves, but the press. The 
And just as the first chapter makes the point that the vision of the Constitution has somehow become uh, obscure to us, the second chapter makes the point that specific, the First Amendment in particular uh, is unknown to most of us. And by the First Amendment, I mean specifically the, the Press Freedom Clause. When we think of the First Amendment today, we tend to think of it as a license to offend. We tend to think of it as something that can be used by art museums when they put on a really edgy show. We think of it as something a network can use if they get in trouble for obscenity. So they have the First Amendment right to do or say whatever they want. The assumption there is that the Press Freedom Clause it was written to protect the owners of the media. Well, that's simply wrong. The purpose of the First Amendment's Press Clause is to protect the people by providing a necessary check on government power in the form of an unfettered, independent press, often scurrilous, it's true, never objective in those days. But still, what we must have, if we're going to have a democracy at all, if we're going to be protected from our government, is, is a press that will consistently tell us what the government is doing and seek to engage us in political debate about it. And the second chapter uses, I mean, I use in the second chapter to illustrate how dangerous the press's uh, um, failure has been by going into the story of Scott Ritter. You may remember Scott Ritter, you know, went to Baghdad to try to get Saddam Hussein to accept weapons inspections and thereby forestall war. I, I got it all there in black and white. It's all sourced. We may forget it because it's over a week old, and this is the culture of TV. But he was treated, the man who knew more about this subject than anyone around, who knew more about weapons of mass destruction than anyone else, was treated like a, a, a traitor and or a lunatic. And it's all there. CNN, he was repeatedly badgered, insulted, harassed. Paula Zahn says to him, people out here are saying you've drunk Saddam's Kool-Aid. Everything he said was lucid and convincing, but then they would drag on people like James Woolsey and many others of that kidney who, uh, <coughs> these are the ones who were always telling us that the Iraqis would be strewing flower petals in front of our troops. So, so they didn't know what they were talking about, and Ritter did. And yet Ritter was discredited. He wouldn't quit. So some of you may know what happened to him then. Anybody know? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a sexual smear. The fact is that um, there was a case. He was charged with trying to solicit sex on the Internet with a minor. The judge in the case thought it was um, a, a, an intolerable case. I, he considered it entrapment. He sealed the case. Can I say that again? He sealed the case. Somehow, the contents of that sealed case, you know, became known to Newsmax.com and, and Matt Drudge. Okay? Uh, okay. I tell Scott's story, and it, it, it makes my blood boil all over again when I read it, and you know, I wrote it. <laughs> but what, 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 what this helps us to see, you know, this, this bizarre uh, situation in which the man who knows what he's talking about is treated like a lunatic, and those who don't know what they're talking about are treated as experts. This is just one manifestation of the curious phenomenon we have in this country now. We, we have two universes. There's, there are two universes. I, I'd say the bare majority inhabits one, and, and a you know, large minority inhabits the other one. Two universes. This pertains to the question, what do they know? What do they know? I, I think that, paradoxically, we, we have a situation in which this highly sophisticated media apparatus that permeates this, this society and culture, this means of communication, unprecedented means of communication, has, has been used to keep people as thoroughly ignorant of the facts, as addled with superstition and nonsense as, as people in the 12th century. I mean, I, I talk to them all the time. I get emails from them. 
All they do is tune into Rush. They watch Fox. Uh, they read books like uh, what Dereliction of Duty or you know Hannity or whoever. They l listen to Ann Coulter. They they maybe they belong to those right wing book clubs. And to be perfectly honest, they can also occasionally pick up the New York Times and have some of their notions reconfirmed there too. Ritter is an example. Uh, Michael Kelly wrote a profile of Ritter for the Times. So it was a complete hatchet job. So you can walk around utterly confident utterly confident that you can know the score and, and you, it's as if you were raised in in the remotest jungles of South America that's that's how much you know you know you you're, you're it, it's it's staggering there's no there's no way to start arguing all of your assumptions are mistaken you know well the next two chapters uh, illustrate this fact by meticulously comparing how the press overfocused on things that Bill Clinton didn't do, okay, comparing that with how the press has completely ignored infinitely worse things that Bush has done. See? And I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm an ardent Clinton supporter. I consider him a moderate Republican. <laughs> uh, um, my views of Clinton are based on his policies. Their views of Clinton are based on some some need they have and this this pertains to the question what do they want so i'll, I'll give you uh, the way that i begin these two chapters just so you get a flavor of of uh of the exercise everybody in here remembers the haircut on the runway no doubt is there anyone who does not know what i mean when i say the haircut on the runway wow okay so there's this story this is what uh, Shortly after he was inaugurated, I mean, it was early in his presidency, the story uh, emerged that he had gotten his tresses trimmed on Air Force One, uh, trimmed by Christoph of Beverly Hills, $200 a pop for his haircuts, friend of Hillary's. This happened when uh, Air Force One was on the runway at LAX, and because of this narcissistic self-indulgence, air traffic was stalled for, who knows, five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes. This was, the reason we all know about it is because it was inescapable. Everybody got into it. Everybody got into it. The, the press was talking, there were 1,500 print pieces about it alone. The comics were cracking wise about it. Jay Leno, David Letterman. Uh, Republicans were giving bites to the press uh, about how, you know, this guy is out of touch with his roots. Newt Gingrich is on TV talking about the haircut he gets in Marietta, Georgia. It's uh, $1.98, you know, sure thing, sure. <laughs> well, the, the problem with this is that it did not happen. This did not happen. He got, yeah, he got a haircut on Air Force One. There was no delay. There was no delay. No one was delayed. I don't know how many ways I can say it, you know. Uh, David Shaw of the LA Times uh, did a great piece looking into it, and it was all legend. It took on this spin, you know, this Republican spin, and, and, it, and it made Clinton look like Marie Antoinette. <laughs> it made him look extremely inconsiderate, okay? Now compare the haircut on the runway with something that happened when Bush was still in his first year. And I, I, I reckon most of you actually remember it, because it happened here. September 5th, 2001, they had their first state dinner at the White House. They had Vicente Fox come in. And the press was full of, you know, slavering accounts of Laura's red scozzy gown and the, the cunning desserts that they made out of sponge sugar look like little bullfighters or something. I don't know. It was very ancien regime, you know what I mean? <laughs> Speaking of Marie Antoinette. Uh, well, the, the evening climaxed with a 20-minute fireworks display that started at 11 p.m. on a Wednesday night. How, how many of you remember this? Yes. Hundreds of people for miles around were terrified. They thought, they thought we were being attacked by terrorists, you know? The, the, the cops were flooded with calls of distress. 
Uh, kids were awakened on a school night. People are really terrified. It's because the White House didn't think to announce this to its neighbors. A lot of people complained. Who covered this? Where was this covered? The city paper, the, the metro section of the Post, the newspaper in Austin, Texas, and the Houston Chronicle. That's it. Now, I could probably produce in six hours 30 people who could, come, who could attest to what happened because they gave their names. They posted things on the internet. <laughs> they exist. There's nobody who's going to step forward and say, my, my plane was circling for 20 minutes and I missed an important meeting because there are no such people. Okay? Now, this is not, I'm not saying that this is a big deal, this story in itself, you know, the story of the fireworks. I'm not saying it should have led the 6 o'clock news. I'm saying that by the Clinton standard, this should have been covered. Because if Clinton had done it, they would have nailed him to a tree over it. You know? So I, 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 I use this comparison to take us through their respective business histories, their respective military histories, their respective tendencies to lie and so on. And then you realize at the end, you know, that there's Bill Clinton, and then there's Bill Clinton. There's the concoction, the rightest invention. Everything that's hideous, everything that's decadent, that's soft, that's 60s, that's carnal, that's liberal. That Clinton, Bush is Clinton. Bush is that Clinton. I mean, everything that they said about Clinton actually applies more to Bush. Well, this is already, to, to read this far is already just to see into a kind of abyss. It's dizzying, you know? Because everything that's officially true is false. And everything that's not mentioned or is officially false is true. And it starts to seem very Orwellian. Now, what is this? What do they want? What do these people want? Are they conservatives? No. This is not a conservative movement, not by any stretch of the imagination, as I think more and more conservatives are discovering. I mean, if conservatism means limits on federal power, if conservatism means a refusal to meddle in the affairs of other nations, if conservatism means fiscal prudence, right? I mean, I could go on. On every score, this is a radical administration. What motivates them? What are they about? Well, what fascinates and frightens me about them is their absolutely unremitting malice. If you took away from this movement the impulse to attack and destroy, invective, ridicule, sh shouting down, ad hominem attacks. If you took that away from this movement, there would be nothing left. That's all they have. They need somebody to hate. With the Cold War ending, all of a sudden, you know, the, the Bolshe menace was gone. Clinton took its place. And now all that uh, outer directed wrath is, is, you know, been trained on most of us. So we got, we got the makings of a civil war. I talk in this penultimate chapter about how this is a projective movement. I use the psychological term projection, which is the tendency to impute to others and attack them for things that you hate in yourself. This is a projective movement. Projective people engage in it. How am I doing for time? Five more minutes. Go on, go on. Go, okay. <laughs> Vox Populi. Okay. First, I, I, I describe the uh, psychological profile of a lot of the most eminent Clinton bashers of the 90s. To illustrate what I mean by projectivity, the quintessential example is Michael Savage. How many of you have heard Michael Savage? Okay. Two things about Michael Savage are most uh, uh, salient. One is his, he's a rabid homophobe. He's the most rabid of homophobes. He lost the TV version of his show Savage Nation because uh, some gay guy called in to complain about Savage's uh, bigotry. And Savage said, oh, you're one of the sodomites, eh? Get AIDS and die, you pig. OK, that's, that's typical of, of Mike. You know, the papers of Allen Ginsberg were recently released at Stanford University. Do you know this? They include love letters from Michael Savage to Allen Ginsberg.
You know, you know, Michael Medved told me that. <laughs> Off mic, he's a little catty. That's not in the book, because I just found it out from him the other day. But what is in the book is a description of Savage's first book called Vital Signs, published in 1983. It's an autobiographical novel, and much of it is concerned with the narrator's fears of his own homosexuality. How does he deal with his attraction to masculine beauty? Well, he, 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 he waits them out, like, like uh, hiding uh, during a storm below decks. It's, I forget the line. It's a good line, actually. Uh, okay, so what we have here is a gay homophobe, okay? And he also... It's a Hitlerian quality to his, his rants. He will go on and on about the disgusting softness, the revolting decadence of liberal democracy. And I heard him, I was sitting in the back of a cab once, and I heard him going on and on about Clinton and how disgustingly, revoltingly soft and decadent and liberal he was. And he compared Clinton to the Weimar Republic. Kids, that's the... Uh, democratic interval before the Nazis took over. See? They felt the same way about the Weimar Republic, so they cleaned it up. You know, now, you know what Savage's real name is? Mike Wiener. <laughs> From the Bronx. So he's a gay homophobe, and he's a Jewish Nazi. And his latest book is called The Enemy Within. Get it? Now, it, this sounds like shtick that I'm doing, but if you, if you look at the, you know, the, if you look at all these people who made a, a career out of attacking Clinton, they were all projective. You know, from Rush, our pot-smoking president, okay, sure thing. You know, it's high on Oxycontin the whole time. You know, William Bennett moralizing. But the point is this. It's not that there are projective persons about. And, you know, Bush himself is highly projective, as I explain in the book, when he talks about Saddam Hussein or Kim Jong-il, and he rants and raves. He's describing himself, right? But my emphasis is not on that. I don't care about these head cases. You know, I'm not <laughs> particularly interested in Bush's Oedipus complex. Oh, there's a very good book about, you know, uh, Bush on the couch is really good. But we don't have time for a cure to kick in, you know? <laughs> and at any rate, what's significant here is not that these are projective people, but that it's a projective movement. This is a projective hate movement. We have seen others like it in the past. We see others like it in the world today. This is a movement that perceives itself as the quintessence of good, as utter purity, as one with God, and sees the hated other as full of wrath and bloodlust. And they want to wipe us out. They're going to kill us. So we have to exterminate them. Now, what this movement is, the name I gave it, and uh, it's not original with me. I got it from a terrific journalist named David Nywert, who writes books about the far right. The movement is Christofascism. Oh, nervous murmuring. <laughs> this is n in no way, not even remotely, an attack on or a critique of religion, or even a critique of religion in politics. It is, however, an alarm about the possibility of a theocracy. Finally, what we have is a projective movement. And the last chapter deals with the extent to which this government's policies express a theocratic agenda. And you know, there's all kinds of stuff in this chapter about Christian Reconstructionism, which is a kind of fringe theology of the religious right that since 1973 has pushed a lot of uh, uh, rightist Christians more and more in the direction of trying to realize a Christian republic on earth. Christian Reconstructionism. There's a, a steering committee uh, of the theocratic element called the Council on National Policy. You can go home and Google search that. Uh, Sun Moon is on it. The Reverend Moon. You know, there's a slight problem with that is he doesn't believe in Christianity. You know, what, he believes in himself. He's Messiah, and his wife, you know, is, is Mrs. Messiah. His, his doctrine is called Godism. He's not a Christian. 
In fact, he attacks Christianity, but he's got a lot of money, and he wants to see a religious state. Now, consider, I mean, how hard is it to connect the dots? We have a full court press against abortion rights. We have a ban on stem cell research. We have a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriages. We have an abstinence-based AIDS policy. Which, you know, at a time when the pandemic is raging all over the world, that's, that's lethal, that's genocidal. The Centers for Disease Control under this regime have released new regulations that actually instruct health workers abroad to tell people that condoms don't work, which is false. It's false. They do work. But their religious zeal pushes them to have people say what's not true because they can accept that. The Reproductive Health Advisory Committee is the top, it's in the Food and Drug Administration, it's the top body that vets gynecological and reproductive therapies. Bush appointed to head that committee a doctor named W. David Hager who refuses to prescribe contraceptives to women and who counsels prayer and Bible reading to treat PMS. Now, I, I could go on, and in the book I do, but we have an Office of Faith-Based Initiatives, which Bush chose to unveil on Independence Day 2001 in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, which is like doing this to the Founding Fathers. An Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. There's one in the White House. There's one in the Department of Justice, Commerce, Labor, HUD, Health and Human Services, and Agriculture. What? Faith-based initiatives in agriculture? What is this? All right. Now, the line, the line is, all they want to do is help out social service agencies that may have a religious bent. What's wrong with that? They're doing good work, right? The Office of Faith-Based Initiatives has thus far not given a dime to any Jewish groups or any Islamic groups. And from what I can tell, they haven't given a dime to any liberal Christian groups. So it's, it's basically a, a, a pack, you know? It's a political entity, and it's all about proselytizing. And thousands of American missionaries are now over in Iraq trying to convert the Muslims to Christ. Some of them are getting killed. I read about it on the BBC's website. It's never covered here. There's a book you may have in the store called The Bushes, Portrait of a Dynasty. It's a pro-Bush collective biography by Peter and Rochelle Schweitzer. Pro-Bush. A very good book, too. It's got amazing quotes in it. At one point, it quotes a close relative of the president's who says about the war in Iraq, George sees this as a religious war. He does not have a PC view of this war. His view is they're trying to kill the Christians. And we, the Christians, must strike back with more force and more ferocity than they will ever know. This is the mirror image of Osama bin Laden's ideology, which is probably why Al-Qaeda considers him such a gift to them, you know? Now, this is, this is, a, this is a, gr a serious danger we're talking about. We're talking about a movement that actually wants to take us back to a moment prior to the Enlightenment. You know, you ask yourself, how can they say the things they say? How can they persist with the Swift Boat story when it's been devastated by some excellent journalism for a change? And yet they, they keep saying it. How, how can Cheney and Bush keep talking about weapons of mass destruction? Is it because they're liars, as many of the books I mentioned before ins insist? I think they're not lying about that. I think they believe the weapons of mass destruction are there. I think they speak with the conviction of the zealous. It doesn't matter if the story about the Swift Boat veterans is true or not. It serves the cause to say that it's true. Many of these people will assert that this is a Christian republic and that the framers were all pious Christians and the Constitution is a Christian document. This is false. This is false. But uh, one of the leading lights of Christian Reconstructionism, R.J. Rush Dooney, has a notion called, uh, uh, what's it called? Christian revisionism, which basically says, you know, if, if something's not true about the past, it's an act of faith to assert that it is true. <laughs> That this is mad. This is madness. We're talking about the handmaid's tale here. That's, that's the most appropriate dystopia for this moment. Now, what I'm trying to say is that uh, 
I'm going to, I'm going to make a political application and then I'm going to stop. People on the left or people who are not on the right uh, say, you know, oh, Kerry, disappointed in him. Marxists of my acquaintance will say there's not a dime's worth of difference between Kerry and Bush. Now, I'm, I consider myself an independent and not a Democrat. But the fact is that there is a tremendous amount of difference between the candidates and the parties, as corrupted as the Democratic Party is by corporate donations as out of touch with its natural constituencies as it is, it still does appear to be a party whose members believe in American democracy. To expect someone further to the left to emerge from this crucible is self-indulgence. It's childish. Thomas Jefferson said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Now think about that. And that's something I used to chuckle at when right-wingers said it when I was 12, you know, the Minutemen, because they thought it referred to communism. They thought that Russia was going to take over the United States. That was never going to happen. But that aside, they were right. Jefferson was right. The price of freedom is eternal vigilance, not vigilance until 1860, and then we can relax, because power always wants to assert itself. Power always wants to break its bonds, wipe out difference, make everybody look like itself, think like itself, and that's what this movement's about. It's a, it's a power grab by a theocratic elite. So I'd suggest that we appreciate the vision of the Founding Fathers. If we can get through this with a two-party system, if we can get through this with freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and the right of habeas corpus, majority rule. If we can get that back, I submit to you, we will be ahead considerably. Thank you. Uh, so the, I'll take questions, and I'm, you, you must go to the audience microphone, right which is right, right there, and has nobody behind it at the moment. So is there a left and a right drinking water that they put something in and you know, half of the half of the population on the on the right side is suddenly not able to detect this. How do you account for that kind of mentality? Okay, that's a, that's an excellent question, and it has it has. I mean, it seems like a mystery, as you suggest. It seems mysterious, but it's really the result of long planning and and tremendous labor by the right that's been going on since the early 70s. Uh, a terrific book about this is David Brock's new book, The Republican Noise Machine. Excellent. Since the early 70s, uh, the business elites have you know, been working self-consciously to make sure that nothing like the 60s ever happens again. This, this drove them to start the whole landscape of foundations, Heritage, Hoover, AEI, all the rest of them. These foundations were meant to move the discussion rightward by investing in right-wing scholars, by giving euphemistic new names to old racist policies and so on. Now, this also entailed the deregulation of the media, which started under Reagan and came to a kind of its apogee under Clinton. That meant getting rid of the fairness doctrine. That meant allowing one corporation to own hundreds of TV or radio stations. This meant it was possible now to create an entire universe in which, you know, certain people, people of a certain temperament, people with certain resentments feel, feel compensated for their anger. I, this sounds glib, I know. But, I mean, if you read what Roger Ailes has to say about Fox Network, he says explicitly, we're, we're about resentment. So a lot of the people who, who will light up like a Roman candle at the sound of Clinton's name and who will defend Bush to the death are, are the ones being the most badly screwed by this administration. But 
for some of us, it's enough just to have the opportunity to scream and yell along with the angry guy, like Rush or, or O'Reilly. The Republicans, as Tom Frank demonstrates in his book, What's the Matter with Kansas, another great book, the Republicans successfully managed to define the Democrats as elitists, see, and themselves as populists. So all this work, all this sober, I, I would say brilliant political work, has had the effect you would expect it to have, you know? I mean, if you target a certain audience and you know what they want to hear, and you surround their consciousness with nothing but this din, uh, that's what'll happen. It's not the drinking water, it's not genetic differences. The only thing that can shake people out of a trance like that is when that view collides violently with some reality in their own lives. And this is why, it's, you know, it's beyond tragic, but this is why Bush has half as much rural support now as he did three years ago. Because those are the people whose kids are getting killed in the Middle East, right? Uh, he has much less support, according to his own pollsters, among the white working class. People wake up. They woke up in the 30s. They woke up during the Vietnam War. It's a shame that it takes something like that, but such is life. Uh, you don't have to answer this, because I was going to ask exactly the same question. I'll, I'll just all, give you the same answer. But, but well, let me give you a variation on this. We all are educated. We go to kindergarten. We grow up. We graduate. A uh, good bunch of us go off to college, some get a master's, some get a PhD. A lot of very smart people in this country. How come ha half of the minds go to jelly? <laughs> well, you know, uh, people can be extremely literate and educated and, and still succumb to this kind of thing. It's, this is not actually a case only of the bourgeoisie being misled while we enlightened ones know the score. I mean, uh, on the contrary, I don't think that educated people, as, as, as you put it, uh, have allowed themselves to take in this menace. I, I think that people are in denial. I think the choir, I think the choir is big enough by far. I mean, it's not just Democrats anymore. I mean, real conservatives are also joining the choir. It's not that the choir's not big enough, it's that the choir's not scared enough. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Why is it, can you hear me? Yeah. Why is it that people who seem to have integrity, like John McCain and other certain Republicans who have some integrity, why aren't they turning on um, Bush and doing what pe the, the Republicans did uh, dur during the Nixon administration? Well, that's a good question, and I think integrity is is the key consideration here. You know, I, I, I can handle any conservative or any liberal if they're people of principle. That is to say, if they're people who believe in the system. You know, democracy depends on trust. You trust your adversary to be negotiating in good faith, right? People like McCain, I you know, I've learned not to sit back in my armchair and criticize politicians because it's an unnatural life. What they're doing is practically impossible, you know? And I, I don't pretend to have any inside knowledge, you know, I'm not Jeff Greenfield. But, um, sorry to disappoint you. I, uh, McCain, it seems to me, uh, is someone who is very, very carefully managing his performance so that he can come out and give Bush a shot now and then and then he'll go and hug him somewhere, you know, in front of an audience to make up for it. McCain hates Bush, hates him, and that hasn't changed. Uh, Republicans, however, have a tr an amazing sense of party discipline. I think that m many moderate Republicans are actually working against the administration even as we speak, but they won't come out and do it, you know. But they have certainly alienated the New England Republicans and you know, Charles Grassley, I mean, you know? Uh, so I, I think that people of integrity like that uh, are doing what they can do. Not enough. Not enough, but, you know, <laughs> you do what you can. Hey, um, my question is, uh, at, at the beginning of, of your book, um, you say something along the lines of we need to 
um, do whatever we can within the framework of the Constitution to sort of restore our country. Um, and I was wondering if you actually think that's possible, because as you go through the book, um, it like you show how the election was hijacked, how um, the uh, polls uh, in, in this election and in the 2002 election uh, are likely to be completely corrupted uh, with the electronic voting. Um, and I don't know, it, it seems to me that it's possible that the optimism of enlightenment thinking and, and the idea that um, the Constitution gives validity to our system, um, that that's actually, uh, there's a hole in there somewhere that's led to Bush Cheney. Um, well, uh, not a hole in there so much as a you know a, a betrayal of those principles, a neglect of those procedures, uh, and you know it's going to sound so retro, but a loss of virtue. Now I know if everybody hears that they think, oh Clinton, oh blowjob in the White House. No, a civic virtue, what the framers called civic virtue, refers to the willingness to f sacrifice one's own pleasure or convenience for the greater good. The system has been very seriously corrupted by an ethic of greed, you know? I mean, yes, the market and purchases and all that kind of thing had a lot to do with the formation of this republic, but it's not the only thing, right? Benjamin Franklin once said, it's, he's quoted in Gore Vidal's new book, To Build a, Na a Nation, To Invent a Nation, uh, that, you know, if the people ever lose their virtue, this whole thing will, will fail. I think the American people, on the whole, are more virtuous than the people in the government or in the media. I have an abiding, maybe naive and idiotic faith in the rational majority if they know what's going on. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm suggesting that rather than come at this thing as leftists, which immediately ghettoizes us, we just come at this as Jeffersonians. I mean, we have the right to lay claim to that tradition. I don't know if I've answered you or not. No, I think so. Okay. Thank you. My question doesn't sound quite as smart as I thought it did, but uh, um, what do you think of what seemed like a break by Cheney when he uh, talked against the constitutional amendment um, and came out for freedom of people to, you know, have relationships with anyone they wanted to? Even though he still, you know, kept up with the states um, making the final ruling, there is deal or not. <laughs> well, uh, my view is that nothing they do is uh, spontaneous or sincere. <laughs> I mean, nothing. And, and they are always accusing the Democrats of politics. Poli it's just a typical projection. Uh, it's just politics. Mm -hmm. Bush supporters say Kerry's religiosity, that's P PR, not really a Catholic. But Bush is sincere. Well, Bush actually is sincere in his religion. At any rate, I, I think that it may be a way to keep some log cabin Republicans from bolting. It may be uh, a way to uh, allow the Republicans to say in our big tent there really is a diversity of views. Remember how they used William Weld at the, at the Republican convention? They had him very calculatedly give a speech in favor of, of, of abortion rights and they booed him and practically killed him but they had him do that so they could say see we're not as intolerant as those liberals you know it, it's, it's extremely cynical and there may also be I mean let's he's human Cheney's human maybe it's you know his family peace depends on his defending his daughter you know I mean I'm, I don't see them as demons that's, that defines the way they see their adversaries. They see their adversaries as demons. Uh, that's, that's what makes them dangerous. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you talk a little bit about this next civil war? Um, I mean, it's very interesting because, you know, obviously I, I love reading books like yours, and I read Dean's book and Brock's book, and, but on purpose, I just to be better informed, I read what the other side is writing it's about. It's a good idea. And I look at the websites of Heritage and Town Hall and all that. Right. And I've noticed this talk about a civil war. And when I bring it up to my friends or point it out to my colleagues, they kind of think I'm crazy. And I see it's really funny because when you're reading the stuff being published by the right, the blogs and all that, they keep talking about a civil war and that we're headed to one. 
So I, you mentioned it earlier, and well, I just... you know, they are intent on the violence that they keep imputing to us. They are intent on silencing us, and the evidence for this is their constant complaint that the left wants to silence them. It, they really are no different from the Islamists in this way. They want a civil war. They want to bring it on. Would it, would it be like red versus blue oh, states? I, I, I don't, or? Yeah, the red versus blue <laughs> states thing, that's overhyped. Mm -hmm. I mean, Illinois, Illinois is a blue state. What do you, what do you make of that? I, I thought uh, Barack Obama put it very well. That, that's simplistic. I, I don't know what it would be like, I, you know, with, if we have uh, Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers. Although, you know, in, I think slavery and, and race has a great deal to do with all of this. You know, it's like central to it. Uh, but I, I can't predict what it will be like. Maybe it won't, with, with God's help, maybe it won't be, you know, an actual confrontation of, of, of armies. But the divisions are deep, and the, uh, the hostility is constantly being exacerbated deliberately by extremely clever pitchmen like, like Rush Limbaugh. You know, it was in 1995, I talk about this in the book, that, you know, Gordon Liddy gave advice on his talk show about how to kill federal agents, and Rush Limbaugh said we were this far from the second violent American revolution. So then Clinton gave a speech, beautiful speech, in which he simply said, you know, you can... If you all believe in freedom of speech, you should use it to speak back to those positions. Because all we hear are those positions. He was immediately accused by the whole right of trying to censor them, trying to silence them. They don't want us to speak. He didn't say that. He said nothing like that. But what they fear, what they see in us, is what they want to do. You know? Uh, sometimes violence is inevitable. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about it, though. Thank you. Okay. How do you explain the administration's continuing popularity in this country? You know, after failing to defend against 9-11... Speak up. Uh, after failing to defend against 9-11, getting, getting us into a war on false pretenses, failing to execute the war and the aftermath properly, and throwing out the Geneva Convention and our alliances, uh, he still has support, the administration still has substantial support in this country. I go to England and Australia, nobody there believes us, and they're our best allies. The rest of the world, you know, we've lost credibility. The administration has Putting lost credibility. And yet, uh, the popularity in this country... Oh, okay, wait a minute. That's it. <laughs> yeah. There's two, actually, I've got to make a distinction here. He has, the administration has substantial support. But it is not a popular administration. It's not popular. There's no evidence that it's popular. It was never popular. Neither was his father ever popular. The only time that Bush Sr.'s ratings broke, you know, 50% was when he attacked a country. And the only time this guy's ratings went up was uh, when everybody was in a state of terror. You know, and, he, and, and they managed, you know, against great odds to project him as a competent, caring father figure, which people needed at the time is not popular. But the press, the media keeps telling us he's a popular president. The popular president, a popular president, a popular president. That's a Republican talking point, and they're always saying it. He's not popular. You know, he's actually pretty unpopular. I mean, how could all these books and movies be coming out? Is it a tiny cadre of liberal conspirators who are doing this? He is not popular. He is beloved by certain members of his base who look at him and see themselves, that's my view, who buy his, his pose, will not hear a word spoken against him, will shrug off any evidence. It's, you can't argue with it. It's irrational. I never heard any Democrats talking that way about Clinton. You know, there's a difference. But I th see, the, this becomes dangerous, this media representation of him as, you know, Huey Long, you know, just beloved. That really endangers us because it does go abroad and you know the more the world thinks that we're in lockstep behind this guy uh, the more they're gonna hate us and the more they're gonna think about hitting us again I mean I, if I were them I would want to do that you know how could a whole nation support this guy but they don't a crisis before the elections could get him elected yes the, the main worry see my, my view this is my view okay this is uh, Jeff Greenfield again okay it's just off the top of my head. 
I think that if Kerry and Bush had their race today, Kerry would win easily if the election were honest. If all the people who won a vote could vote and the votes were counted, so I think Gore would have won handily. You know, Nader made it easier for the Republicans to win, but if, if you think they weren't going to steal the White House anyway, if you think 537 Florida votes would have been enough, you know, to have them say, oh, okay, all right, you can take it, you know, you, you're not paying attention. They're intent on stealing it. Uh, and I'm, I worry about two things. One is the electronic touchscreen machines, which the state of Maryland has just uh, basically supported. In some other states, they've been decertified, but this is a, this is a calamity, you know, that, that a democracy's electoral infrastructure should be privately owned by partisans. It's insane. It's got to change. And the other thing to worry about is terrorist manipulation of the emotions. My view, Frank, you know, there's every evidence, as I said before, that the Islamists are grateful that Bush is president. He gave them way more than they bargained for. I mean, he said they hit us because they thought we were soft. That's, what, that's one of these things that just passes as, as a rational utterance on TV. What on earth does that mean? They, 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 they thought we were soft. They flew two planes into the buildings and into the Pentagon because they thought, we, what, what did they think we were going to do so soft as we are? Start, you know, facing Mecca? <laughs> then he said to Larry King the other night, um, you know, they haven't uh, done anything lately because I think they, they're, ho they're thinking that we'll forget about it. You know, he, I think he really believes this stuff, but the, the fact is that they got exactly what they wanted, and when he attacked Iraq, it was like a present, and their recruitment has skyrocketed, you know? So, it seems to me that if there's an attack before the election, and I'm, you know, let's not think for the moment of Reichstag fire type attacks that we do ourselves, if Al-Qaeda, or you know, whatever you want to call it, pulls something off prior to the election, it will be because it's their determination that that will help elect him. It's not entirely clear that it would have the same effect it had three years ago, because he has told us repeatedly that we're safer. <laughs> so I, I think that the, the reverence, the, 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 the uh, reverence of the father figure would be less widespread. They might, you know, attack after the election, during the lame duck period. I mean, this is, now we're getting into science fiction. There. And then they, you know, okay, we, we can't have a transition of governments yet because it's too dangerous. I, I, you know, they will do anything. They will do anything. And uh, let me add that, that the press is so grievously at fault for not reporting with all due emphasis, the absolutely outrageous infringements of people's civil liberties. I mean, the story of Ted Kennedy being you know, not allowed to board a plane. Oh, it was played for giggles. It was a mistake. Let me tell you something. I was on Jesse Jackson's radio show two weeks ago. He flew out to New York from Chicago, did his show. Afterwards, his assistant told me that at O'Hare Airport, Jackson had been stopped and searched five times. Jesse Jackson's going to hijack a plane? No, I mean, you know, it took the press two years to talk about the no-fly lists. Uh, you know, FBI agents are dropping in on possible protesters. It's, it's brown shirt material. And they use smears with such abandon. You know, I, I think they're gangsters. The crisis before the elections may be us attacking. Us? Uh, what do you mean? Responding to a crisis, the United States. Uh, uh, as George Bush the first went into the election, he was facing four crises, and he didn't he didn't respond to any of those four crises. If he had responded to any one of them, um, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, Somalia, Haiti, Algiers, uh, he probably would have gotten elected. Hey, maybe. Thank you. I completely agree with your critique and the danger and the extreme dangerousness that uh, the, the, the people you're talking about have. What I think, though, you've left out is the receptivity. And, I don't, and perhaps in your book you examine this. But I think that the, the fact is that the reason that these, this demagoguery 
has has an effect is because there is a cultural crisis in the country and the fact is none of us here i suspect in this room nor anybody i know would conceive of grow voting for bush but half the country out there is making this a very close election and I tend to doubt that the press is having as much effect as you as you uh, are talking about because I think if they reported all the things you're talking about, all of us in this room would be twice as angry, and all of the rest of the people who are already voting for Bush wouldn't give a damn. No, I, I hear you. That's and a good so point. The, the, so I think demagoguery only falls on fertile ground, and the fact that I think that we liberals have disregarded in many ways the extreme religious feelings of half the population. It's not, that, that, it's not half the population. Well, the, the polls show that despite everything that's going on, half the, this is a very, very close election. I mean, it's not, you know, as far as we're concerned, it should be a walkover. But it's not. No, I, you're absolutely yeah. right. I don't so, mean no, uh, the, but the, the point I'd, I'd like to ask you to address is how, given this, it seems to me that all of this, in a sense, is coming out of half of the population that we liberals have not talked to. And it's there. And I don't think the press is enforcing this. Okay. I think the press is representing this in many well, ways. Well, okay, that's a, a good point. Let, let me let me suggest that we not conceive of that half of the country as such a monolith. The evangelical movement is actually quite diverse. Twenty yep. percent of them are progressives, you know. Uh, and while there will always be people who will not wake up, you know, Nixon said in his dotage, uh, one third of the electors, electorate's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was he knew what he was. Which third? He knew what he was talking about. Well, a third of the Germans voted for Hitler. There's a, there's like a, a a rump of the body politic. It's kind of like the primitive part of the brain, you know. But people can change their minds and learn, and and it is happening. And and in, in specific reply, you're absolutely right. Media coverage of this kind does not reach a whole lot of those people, right? They get it through Rush. Also, in many parts of the country, and this, is, this would be treated as a problem by a, a reasonable government, in many parts of the country, people don't get any news. They get gospel music, they get n nothing, right? How to explain, then, that Bush has lost half his rural support? Now, I don't think it's because those people have read about the Valerie Plame story. I think it's because, as I said before, their kids are at risk. Their kids are the ones who go and die. Uh, they aren't monoliths. They're human beings, just like us. They can change their minds. No, no, no population can be blamed for knowing only what it knows. You follow me? I mean, under Stalin, under Ceausescu, under you name it, Milosevic, people only knew what they knew. They didn't know what they didn't know. You, f you see what I mean? And we, we don't know what we don't know. There's tons of stuff that I could tell you that you probably haven't heard because nobody reported it. I, I mean, it, it would make a great, you know, daily show. Just here's here's an item, here's an item, here's an item. Did you hear about the thing in Oregon? Anybody hear about this? How many? Oregon? Okay, some 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 reservists, some Oregon Army reservists were patrolling Iraq and they came across a compound where plainclothes Iraqis were torturing and beating a bunch of prone, bound captives, Iraqi, other Iraqis. It was just like the, what they did to the Shia, the Shiites, uh, you know, after the war. These guys, you know, acting nobly, stopped it. They cut that out. Just get away from him. Untie him. They reported this to their superiors, and the superiors said, leave. Just ignore it. Now this... This was in the Oregonian and on the AP. The AP story ran in the Times. The Oregonian story ran in the Seattle Times. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. That's true of so many stories. You know, uh, th that's the problem. I think, you know, to speak optimistically enough to suggest that we can move beyond this election and, and do some serious work to prevent this stuff from happening, what we really need is media reform, because our, 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 media, our media system is, is a disgrace, it's an embarrassment.
can I ask a brief, brief just a yeah. brief follow-up in this? That I think that the, I, I know you're a professor of media studies, but I, I feel that you're putting too much me, uh, 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 emphasis on the media and the, all of the things you're mentioning will not have that much effect. The question, the fact is that people who start off from a religious point of view, believing that a, abortion is a sin against God, who believe that religion, the United States should be religion, these are the people who are not going to vote for Kerry come hell or high water, well, no matter should, all of this. Why should everybody vote for Kerry? Well, he's at the moment, everybody. he's the choice. No, no, why, yeah. why, why should everybody vote for Kerry? Yeah, the people see things differently, I agree, but don't, don't spook yourself with that fact. I mean, you know, you, you, to some extent, you inhabit the reality you create. And if you see them as an absolutely immovable block of, you know, hopeless cases. That's a, that's a, that's a, yeah, I haven't, well, okay. <laughs> Two more questions. Two more. Uh, good evening. Uh, knowing you were coming here, about a week ago I ran across something, and I almost immediately said, you know, if, if Mark Crispin, Crispin Miller doesn't know about this, he ought to. But I didn't know why. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> and now I do, having heard you tonight. Uh, this is from a book called 50 Years of the Texas Observer. Huh. Um, you know about that yeah. particular publication. And it's 1964 editorial. Uh, two quick passages from it. It's called This Man, George Bush. And it is about Bush, the senatorial candidate, the elder Bush. Presenting himself as, quote, responsible, he says his conservatism is, quote, compassionate. <laughs> 1964. What do you know? Yet he has so little sensitivity for the feelings of the needy aged, he wittily compares medical care for the aged with a federal program to air condition ship holds for apes and baboons, a program which he has dubbed, quote, medical air for the caged. He proposes that the United States arm a new invasion of Cuba. Specifically, he says, we should recognize a Cuban government in exile. Sound familiar? Yeah. Give it economic and military assistance, and then, quote, when this government goes to liberate its own homeland, let's not be lacking in courage. Now, 40 years ago, ridicule, derision, attack from the older Bush a Bush who's disappeared from history, because everyone now knows that George H.W. Bush is a moderate and has always been a moderate. But it didn't work. You know, Goldwaterism fell completely flat. Right. This time it's worked much better. Right. Another Bush saying the same things, the same kind of abusive, offhand types of things. But there's a spine here, and the spine is theocracy. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's true. Compassionate conservatism, although it's, it's an uncanny fact that Poppy used it then, is a phrase that was coined by Marvin Olasky. Marvin Olasky is a Christian Reconstructionist. He went from Maoism to Christian Reconstruction. And I, I don't believe there was an interim of liberal democracy in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, you know, he is a, is a disciple of R.J. Rush Dooney's. His career has been financed by Howard Amundsen, who is a California multimillionaire who is also a theocrat. Uh, it's, it's, so, yeah, you're right. This stuff sort of welled up in the early 60s. But what gave it momentum and sh shape and force was the organized religious right, which has entailed, by the way, uh, the betrayal of the Jeffersonian tradition by a lot of Protestants who formerly were ardent Jeffersonians. It's worth noting, the separation of church and state was the joint work of the rationalists in Philadelphia and a lot of religious people. I mean, Rod Roger Williams was the first great defender of the separation of church and state way back when for entirely different reasons, because he thought government's worldly and therefore corrupt. It should have nothing to do with religion. Well, you know, after the Constitution was written, and after Jefferson beat the theocrats in 1800, uh, he had on his side, like the Baptists, for example, were ardent Jeffersonians because they knew that if there's a state religion, they would probably be oppressed by it. You know? So this is something I think Kerry could say, and we can all say the separation of church and state is not about smart ass lawyers trying to extirpate every religious symbol in the world from the public square. It's about ensuring religious liberty. 
You know, Tocqueville said this is the most religious country in the world. And he said the reason for that is church and state are separated. Thank you. Okay. One, one more. I have a really quick question, so maybe it shouldn't count as the last one. But um, I, I, I want to I I know. Um, louder, louder, louder. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, the photograph of George Bush on the cover of your book is invaluable. Where, where did I get where it? Where was that taken? What's the context? It was uh, taken by Reuters. A friend of mine emailed it to me. And. Uh, it was like the top of my head had opened and light had shone in. Yeah. You know, sometimes the camera doesn't lie. It's a fascinating picture. Well, I've been collecting images not only of him, but just in the newspaper of, of many of his administration. And I mean, they've mastered the sneer. It, they're scary if you put them all together. <laughs> Should I take one more? One more, one more. We're going to be a sport about it. Professor Miller, I plan to purchase your book tonight. I haven't read it, but I. <laughs> I've enjoyed your book and plan to purchase it tonight. I was wondering if you connected the dots in your book between the Christo-fascist group you speak about tonight and the zealots in Israel and the fact that they're bringing about an apocalyptic yeah. end to the world by virtue of their policy. Well, yes, there, I, in the book I do discuss, uh, in fact, as a prime example of how American theocrats drive U.S. foreign policy, our Iraq, our, sorry, our Israel policy. Uh, you know, there's a legend on the left, that I think also on the right, you know, Pat Buchanan no doubt subscribes to it, that the, this policy is the work of a sinister Jewish cabal of neocons around Cheney and Rumsfeld. Well, there, is, there, is, there are such neocons, and they are Jewish, and they are Zionists. But to impute this policy to them alone, is, it's like the tail wagging the dog. There are about 20 million self-professed Christian Zionists in this country, and they believe that Israel's destiny is to have all the Jews go back there, uh, take up greater Israel, drive out all the Palestinians, because the Christian Zionists don't think there's such a thing as a Palestinian, and then uh, 144,000 of these Jews will become Christians, and the rest will, you know, fry with everybody else, and then he'll come back. I think I have that right. It's in the book of Revelation. You know, the, the neocons, for reasons I discuss in the book, being all Straussians, have strange things in common with the Christian uh, Reconstructionists and the theocrats. And I'm, I'm not going to go into it now. Um, what was the, the last thing I said before that? <laughs> Come on. The What's a Straussian? Uh, Leo Strauss was a German philosopher who came over here in the 30s. Uh, was a kind of neo-Machiavellian. Uh, his philosophy is all about hierarchy. Uh, it's very, very, con it's really conservative. Uh, and he had a tremendous amount of influence on a second generation of academics, all of whom taught the neocons. They all went to graduate school. You know, William Crystal, Richard Pearl, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, Fife, uh, Ahmed Shalabi also. They all went to graduate school and studied under these people, these Straussians, whose view is that um, the virtuous men have to rule the state through the prince. See? And uh, I guess I'll say it. I said I wouldn't say it. Uh, the Stra Strauss, although an atheist, believed that one of the worst things that ever happened to human history was that religious government disappeared. Because he believed in religious government, not out of piety, but out of a desire to see people kept docile. So they, they worked together very well. Elliot Abrams, top Middle East expert in the National Security Council, uh, meets all the time with a group here called the Apostolic Congress, which describes itself as the Christian voice in the nation's capital. Condi Rice has talked to Jack Van Imp. I mean, it's just, you know, it sounds like comedy. But, uh, you know, it's all about power. It's all about building a coalition. And it has everything to do with uh, the policy in Israel. And th there, there is a close spiritual tie between, say, you know, Tom DeLay mm -hmm. and, and the, most, uh, uh, the most ferocious settlers over there. They're, they're birds of a feather. I know what I was going to say. It was the, Tom DeLay was the person that this administration sent to speak to the Knesset. Mm -hmm. 
Tom DeLay, Sugarland, Texas, you know, a man innocent of foreign policy experience, but a Christian reconstructionist, you know, an ardent theocrat, he went over to Israel and gave them a speech saying, this is a matter of good versus evil. Mm -hmm. This is very plain. You must never conciliate with the Palestinians. Never. That's helpful, right? <laughs> but that, you know, that's it. That's, that's, that's a cauldron. And let me, let me end on one note. This is the last thing I'll say. Uh, this outfit differs from all previous administrations in many ways. But what was most dangerous about them is that they are apocalyptic. They're, you know, if the Middle East blows up, that's a good thing in their, in their eyes. And if the earth is utterly ravaged by, you know, poisons, that's not such a big deal. Uh, many Christian reconstructionists have written pointedly about environmentalism, which they regard as a, as a cross between paganism and Stalinism. They hate environmentalism. They think that our stewardship of the earth should be based only on Genesis 128. Man shall have dominion over the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and every living thing that moveth. Well, Ann Coulter says the same thing. You know, her language isn't as pretty as that. Uh, so, so, you know, an apocalyptic movement does not believe, as Jefferson did, that life is for the living. You know? I mean, this is our country, and we should be running it for our own, uh, you know, happiness and freedom. It's as simple as that. Thanks. Thank you. Mark Crispin Miller is author of The Bush Dyslexicon. He's a professor of media studies at New York University. For more information on Cruel and Unusual, Bush Cheney's New World Order, visit the publisher's website at www.norton.com.